Hello again everyone and welcome to another YYT Deck Tech Talk with Steve D. Today I'm going to be talking about one of my favourite, but at the same time one of my least favourite decks in Final Fantasy, that is Water Wind YRP. I think that YRP is actually a very strong reason or a very compelling argument for there being a rotation, or at the very least a much more heavy ban list for Final Fantasy, because basically this same archetype has been a top tier deck, maybe even the best deck in the game, since roundabout Opus 2. And with every set that comes out, the deck is only going to get stronger, combos are only going to become stronger and more consistent over time, and I think that that could be a bit of a problem going forwards. The deck also lost one of its major counters of heavy discard, or at the very least got an improved match up against it with the introduction of Porom, and when 6 CP Famfrit was spoiled at the start of this format, I actually found it quite demotivational, and I knew that Mill was going to be quite a serious deck with the Riku backup. However, times have changed, and I feel a lot more motivated to talk about this deck, because it is still one of my favourite decks with regard to the player feeling like they have a lot of control, uh, that there are so many decisions to make in this deck, and there's a lot of different ways that you can sort of tech a deck list, whether you prefer to be more aggressive, or whether you prefer crazy late game bomb spamming and using Vilfor to generate a lot more CP. So uh, th this is now my favourite take for the Opus 9 format, with the assumption that Riku has been banned, because that card is absolutely toxic. So the real reason why RP is so good is because of Vilfor and Pain. Just a little bit of a catch up in case you're not really familiar with how this deck works. If you have a Yuna and a Riku on the field, Pain literally costs nothing. She will activate three backups when she enters the field and also draw you a card, meaning she kind of doesn't have a cost in the corner, but also never took up any space in your hand and digs you that much closer to some kind of a combo that's actually going to win the game. Your ability to go Pain, perfectly on curve body, and also play another three cost forward that turn, maybe one that you just drew off of Pain, is incredibly powerful for putting you ahead on field state, and I think that's the real reason that the deck was always good. It just so happens that there's no longer that transitional plan of being able to mill if winning through combat no longer becomes possible. So uh, I think the deck maybe has to work a tiny bit harder to win through combat now that Riku is gone, but uh, Pain made it very easy to win through combat because of how easy it was after the first couple of turns to be ahead on the field. Separately, we've got Veilfur, who has always been Final Fantasy's Exodia. If you we used to be back in Opus 1, if you could cast three of these in a single turn and weren't playing against the Minwu deck, you had pretty much just won, because the ability to do 9000 damage almost always is a complete board wipe, and the fact you can do it during your opponent's turn means that you can take maximum advantage of any characters they also played that turn. Veilfur has not gotten any weaker over time. On the contrary, I think it got a lot more consistent with ways to bring Veilfur back from your break zone, but also other things that do spread damage to your opponent's field that kind of take the burden off having to find three copies of Veilfur before you cast one of them. So, again, with the assumption that Riku is banned, I think the most sensible thing for the deck to do is swap over to the other 2CP Riku. There are lots of other Rikus, most of them being forwards in the game. I think that forwards, even the ones that are untargetable, like the Gullwings in Opus 6, they're a lot easier to deal with, or they can be played around or fanfreted away, whereas backups, particularly cheap backups, are quite difficult to get rid of. They don't die to Alexander, they don't die to Hecatonchir, things like that. I think that for the purposes of pain feeling like a degenerate and broken card, this pain will not notice the difference between this Riku and the Riku that has just been banned. So yeah, like you're still going to be able to get these crazy nut draws where you play pain and another forward on turn three, and then you're just so far ahead for the rest of the game on board. It also means that we've got a couple more EX bursts that might, in really complicated boards, activate one of your big forwards and uh, sometimes prevent a point of damage you didn't need to otherwise take. So yeah, th th this Riku is definitely a really good card, and it did see some fringe play. Yeah, I, I remember there was one deck list at the London Grand Open uh, that, that top cut back in 2018 that was using this Riku alongside the Mill Riku, just for the games where the activation was more important than the Mill, or Mill was obviously not going to matter. Kind of in aggro games, that was a bit more of a concern. So, there's a couple of Yunas available to us as well. I still think that the 2CP Water Yuna is, by a distance, the best of those. I think that Light 2CP Yuna is a lot of fun as well, but she she kind of mandates a lot of unusual changes to the way that your deck is constructed, because I think that the 1CP that's reduced off of your Water Summons is relevant, unless you play a wider range of cards and make them feel efficient. The fact that this Yuna can also be discarded for CP really kind of helps out sometimes. So if you want to, you can check out the deck list in the description of this video. It is Majority Wind. To be honest, I think wind cards are generally are a lot better than water, unless you're playing some kind of a swarm payload where Layla Viking becomes better, and you know, things things like Nickel and Cagnazzo are good in mono water. But for the most part, I think a lot of wind cards are very board agnostic, and you can just play them, and they'll be worth more value than you paid 
to get them onto the field. So uh, I think to take advantage of this inherent sort of a design problem going on with wind, this deck is a majority of wind cards that also impact another few things. So uh, sometimes getting unit into play is a little bit tricky. Try your hardest when you're playing this deck not to discard water cards too indiscriminately in the early game until you've gotten a unit into play. And I would also, any line of play that can allow you to find Yuna, take that before you start playing other forwards onto the field. Because this deck goes into a whole different power level once you have Yuna down to enable Pain and Veil of Her to be really powerful. So, uh, to help us be a little bit more consistent in finding Yuna in particular, but also Riku, I'm playing two copies of Shinra. Shinra lets us search for any Gullwing forward, playing one copy of the Searcher Pain as well from Opus 2, because then when you play this Pain, you can search out either Yuna or Riku, whichever one you happen to be missing. Between three chances to draw them naturally, two chances to draw Shinra, and then a chance to just draw this Pain as well, I think that having a virtual six copies of each of these backups is consistent enough that you will be able to get them online, usually by, you know, no later than turn four, and occasionally there's nut draws where you just drop both of them turn one, and then uh, those games are exceptionally difficult to lose. So... If you see Shinra in your hand on turn one and you don't have a better, you know, even more aggressively playing sensible backups, I think that playing Shinra turn one and searching out this pain for turn two is perfectly acceptable and will win you a lot more games than it loses. Three copies of Fina. For the most part, Fina is two extra Veilfors attached to a body. And I think that the combo is, uh, although it was only new in Opus 9, I think it's almost overdone by now, so I won't dwell on it for too long. Occasionally you get really weird times where you would rather activate your whole field for a bit of a buffer against like an attacking Illua. But uh, yeah, I think that almost always I will spend three backups doing something cheap or playing a cheap body, spend two backups on a veil for if I've got Yuna out, and then discard a card and play Fina to 8k my opponent's field. Not exactly new stuff, but it's still just as good this format because I think 8000 is even more of a relevant number than it was before. As in, there are not especially many 9000s, but there's a lot of plus 1k backups and decks for those 7ks. The other cards that I think are pretty much mandatory, or, or at least very much part of the stock list for any YRP, three copies of Zidane. Zidane does a lot of very good work for shutting out cards that you're afraid of. For instance, if you go first and uh, your opponent on their first turn plays an Ice Backup, you can actually win those matchups without too much difficulty. I don't think Big Discard is really all that concerning, unless they force you to discard a couple of really good setup cards in the early game. So being able to play Zidane turn 2 against Ice and Scout for Sephiroth, for instance, or Scout for Garland, is really quite powerful, even if it does sound like a 2000s boy band. Zidane has got other implications because of a couple of backups, or a, a pair of Mayuni in the deck anyway. Uh, th th this deck has got a couple of really powerful on-entry abilities that I've kind of centred in the middle here. We'll go over Mayuni a little bit more when we get there, but yeah, Zidane is just generically decent and uh, kind of dominated the Opus 8 format because I think a lot of decks were concealing powerful things in hand. There was a lot of Earthwind Phoenix, there was a lot of YRP, and so I think that Zidane was one of the best cards in the format because those decks tended to fall apart part a little bit more when you took a really good card out of someone's hand. So if you're if you're ever in a mirror match, aim, aiming for things like Veilfors that you want to hold on to for a while until the timing is right is a very good way to disassemble them. The new kid on the block from Opus 9, but very much one of the most powerful cards in the deck, three copies of Porom. I really didn't like Porum much when I saw it, and uh, I, I know as well that Alex Hancock uh, was completely disinterested in this format when he first saw Porom and, and realised how degenerate it was going to be. To be honest, I think that Poron was significantly more degenerate in the Mill era, because it became very easy to loop really powerful summons, and the maths of a lot of decks, a lot of decks that adhered to the old 23 forwards, 10 summons, 17 backups rule, they would just fall apart and they, they would become incapable of dealing 6 damage if you were able to remove a certain amount of forwards in a certain cluster of time. And Porum made it trivially easy to do that against most mid-range decks, so you either needed to race aggro, or you needed a much more ambitious control plan that basically control is quite weak to mill at the best of times because you want games to drag on so uh yeah with riku th that riku gone i think that porum's power level feels a lot more in check and i don't think it's as easy to just spam famfrit now because famfrit is very good at clearing the field but that also applies to you you lose a body as well and when you're losing bodies it becomes harder for you to deal seven damage so i don't think necessarily famfrit is uh, an auto include anymore and certainly not the 6 cp famfrit because it's, its main purpose seems to be just clearing the field back to zero but 
I think Porum often represents an extra veil for, means you can be a little bit more liberal about discarding a veil for in the early game, whereas previously, even as recently as Opus 8, I never wanted to discard one, and I thought that matches would become a lot harder if I ever did discard a veil for or a Fina. Porum eases a lot of that burden, and is a completely needless EX burst as well. I, I totally don't think it needed to be. I think that if you want to, you could include something spicy like Lena to recur your Porums, depending on how powerful you think they are, or how much you value certain summons in your build, so let me know in the comments. On to the portion of the deck that I think is a little bit more down to personal flavour. Right now, I think that Yuri versions of the deck, or FFCC in general, is very strong, and a very nice fit with Vilfer. It's easy to dull down Yuri and two backups, or sometimes three backups of a particular colour, to use one of Yuri's effects, and then use Vilfer to get all of your backups back again. Uh, th th this has kind of been on the go and, and been a pretty premium deck since round about Opus 7, but right now it's in a really good place because Yuri feels difficult to kill, and this deck, uh, you you've certainly got the capability of playing Yustola, to protect these complex boards, and Yuri gets a lot stronger when it has any kind of assurance that you're going to get multiple turns of value out of it. I think the big alternative is playing Veritas instead. Veritas is both good against and in aggro decks because Veritas gives you a very clean and easy solution to your opponent playing one big 9k that threatens to trade with a pair of your 7ks. And uh, yeah, I, I, while I don't think that necessarily big 9Ks like Cecil or something are really that much of a problem against Wind because you have access to Diabolos, more Diabolos than ever before because of Forum, nevertheless I think that Veritas is a very easy legend to just slap down on the first forward your opponent plays and get maybe 4 points of damage out of the tempo that generates. Also, if you are playing Famfret in this deck still, Veritas is very good with Famfret because if you aggressively kill something with an early Veritas and then just as aggressively kill off your own Veritas, often removing a backup that early in the game will completely ruin your opponent's plan or their ability to play on curve, and you still have access to degenerate things like Fina and Veilfor. And trust me when I say Fina Veilfor feels perfectly adequate to do off of two backups, provided one of those backups is Yuna. So yeah, Veritas is an option, and that also frees you up a few slots, because I am playing a bit more FFCC. I think Chilinka is good because she feels like a mini veil for. If uh, if Fina is mega veil for an entry, Chilinka is a bit of a mini veil for. But that 2,000 damage is still incredibly relevant post combat. Is very good for clearing out small things like Vikings that would threaten to buy a little bit of time. And uh, yeah, Vi Viking used to be a sign that you were going to instantly win the game uh, as YRP because Vikings would mean that your opponent would deck out way too quickly. They were almost helping you after a certain point in the game, meaning you needed one less Riku mill for every Viking that you saw. Now, that is not quite as much of the case, and I think that t sustaining some early damage can sometimes be a little bit tricky in close games for YRP, so Chillink is very good for uh, clearing away small weenie forwards, while also comboing into more complex Vilfor turns. So yeah, uh, I think that Chillink is in a good place just now. I'm not playing Alhanalem because I think there's way too many important backups that do more than Alhanalem. Uh, Alhanalem is, is decent, and if you think you really want a 17th backup, by all means play one over one of the forwards. But uh, yeah, I, I think that uh, Yuri and Chilinka individually and the party attack thing that they can do once in a blue moon is stronger than what Alhanalim adds to this deck because we have so many different redundant sources of doing 3000 anyway. I don't really think we need one more on a 2CP backup. So something a little bit spicier I tried after seeing it in a Japanese list and I'd, I'd been having these thoughts for a while, is three copies of Ultros. Ultros is a little bit forgettable, maybe uh, because the art is maybe not Amano's best, but, uh, or, or, or so the YYT think. But uh, yeah, Ultros' effects I think are really quite unique and totally worth 5 CP. Although Ultros is very slow and looks a little bit like Diabolos Bait and doesn't have an on-entry ability, I would look at this a different way and I kind of think it does have an on-entry ability. That ability being, are you really really sure you want to waste a Diabolos on Ultros if you might not get a kill at all? All you might do is just lose a Diabolos from hand and activate your backups again. So the ability, if you've got a reasonably high hand size and if you're playing this deck sensibly you will have a high hand size, Ultros threatens immortality. A lot of the time if you have even a spare Ultros in hand or spare Yunus in hand your opponent just can't safely trade with Ultros, and 9k is a pretty colossal number. Really only Vayne is uh, like the, the only true counter to Ultros uh, over the course of multiple turns, and uh, on top of that, when Ultros attacks, you get to do x thousand damage to your opponent's board, where x is 2 plus the number of Ultros that are in your break zone at the time of resolution. So, at the very least, Ultros, whenever he attacks, feels a lot like what Chilinka does for entering the field, except this is potentially stronger than Chilinka if there's one of your Ultros gone already. It kind of means that you can throw away the first Ultros you see 
to play a Yuna, you know, if, if, it, if it shows up really early, but that Ultros is still going to power up the ones that you see later on in the game. And uh, I've been quite impressed with it, really. Uh, I think that in very Fanfrit-charged metas, it's it's quite powerful, and you will gladly trade a card in your hand, a, a water card in your hand, to keep a body on the board, and that body happens to just smooth out the, the redundancy so that you don't need to form Exodia with three copies of Veilfor in one turn anymore. You can do things like Veilfor, block on Porum, return a Veilfor, or, or, you know, a, a, attack on Ultros. It becomes a lot smoother, basically, is what I'm trying to say to find enough sources of small spread damage that you take out an entire field. And much like, uh, well, m much like uh, Yuri, I suppose, it gives you a turn on turn resource uh, for every turn that Ultros lives. And believe me when I say that people don't want to kill Ultros unless they can be very sure that you don't have two water to revive it or that both of your other Ultros are gone then uh, yeah, it just kind of sits there and gives you that value every single turn. Whereas there's no penalty for killing Yuri, there quite often is a penalty for killing Ultros. The other thing that I think people forget about Ultros as well is that even if you draw your other copies of Ultros until your opponent has looked in your hand from a Zidane kind of effect or until you discard those, your opponent doesn't know that those Ultros are in your hand, so they won't want to waste removal if you have even the possibility of having an Ultros left in deck. So if you really want to, if you really want something that can tuck spare Ultros back into the deck, you could even play Artemision as uh, an extra water source and as a 17th backup to sort of help boost the early game consistency and maybe tuck some Ultros back in deck. But I think that if you've got a good enough poker face, I think it's actually quite possible to just bluff an Ultros still being in your deck, and I found it to be really quite powerful. Also, this deck generates so much free CP off of Veilfors and off of random Fina activations that playing Ultros while, you know, it's still 5 CP, I think 5 CP is sometimes easier to come by. Or uh, when you're playing with maybe 10 CP a turn, I think that you can afford to spend 5 on Ultros just because he's huge. The last of the really chunky forwards I'm playing is Bart's. Like I said before, this is a wind majority deck, and Bart's being able to activate a wind majority of characters often translates to something like posthumously give pain brave and maybe get three or so cp back depending on how many backups you have out and whether or not you commit a second water backup to the field nevertheless i think bars is really strong a very good ex burst it was probably better in the days when riku mill was around because it guaranteed that you had an outlet to use the ex burst cp on you know a backups activated ability or action ability but i still think bars is good enough just for being a, a relatively cheap 9k and uh, that, that's something that really helps you bolster against aggro I'll move on to the rest of the summons. I am still playing three Famfrit, which might feel a little bit unusual considering how many high value forwards I'm playing. Whereas most of uh, most of the pre-ban decks were playing a lot more kind of token forwards or things that the entire point of playing is for the on entry ability. Although I am playing a few more forwards that are meant to generate advantage turn on turn, I still think that Famfrit is quite an important inclusion in the deck because it gives you a, a very easy way of getting rid of Locke or Genesis or something super disruptive that your opponents play very early on. And uh, I'd be lying if I said that it didn't feel kind of good to be able to Famfrit away as a Dane who is now on 3000 power. He's done his job and then exchange you take away one of your opponent's most relevant things. Helps you in pushing for game. It's very, very powerful to be able to loop with Porom. Like, with just a Porum on field and uh, a Famfret in hand, you can kill two of your opponent's forwards for just four CP. And I think that that occasionally gets into a really powerful state as well. So, uh, I, I like what it represents. I don't think I would run zero, but if you wanted to run some split of Famfret and, say, Kuchulane, either of the Kuchulanes, uh, uh, it's really quite potent. I'll, I'll go back and uh, refer to Yuri and Chilinka. If you don't like them, I'm actually not playing any Yustula in this deck, which uh, is a little bit bold considering I'm playing something as high value as Yuri. If you really wanted to, you could uh, trim any of these sort of cards to play some number of Yustola, but I don't really think she's proactive enough for... Uh, she's not the right kind of disruption. She's disruption in a much fairer game, and I don't think that is too important for what YRP is trying to assemble. On with the summons. Three copies of Diabolos. Almost certainly you'll draw the first one of these way too early and have to discard it, but Porum eases that guilt quite a lot, and uh, it makes it very difficult for your opponents to play chunky big forwards every single turn. I think that uh, Porum improves the ice matchup a lot between Opus 8 and Opus 9, partly because Diabolus is that much easier to loop to break you out of random freezes and also get rid of Ice's disproportionately large number of high-costed forwards, and very occasionally you can do weird things where you use one of Yuri's abilities, cast a Diabolus, get all your backups back, just like a really expensive Vilfer. Also, Vilfor and Diabolus is a very easy way to break a couple of forwards by setting one of their powers to 1000, and then Vilfor does the rest. The rest of the deck is backups, and I said before that we need a nice consistent backup rig to help us set up, 
So let's talk a little bit more about some of them. Two copies of Echo. It's a ridiculously good EX burst, and it's a it's a virtual two CP, sometimes virtual one CP backup uh, between the abilities uh, it has. I think it's kind of been a bit of a meta staple since Runabout Opus Five, so I won't dwell on it. But if you absolutely have to, playing Echo on turn one, looking at the top card, and if you don't like it, putting it on the bottom and drawing another one digs you towards more backups very quickly. You've essentially just filtered an entire turn's draws, so that's really good and occasionally you can do weird things where you activate a backup and draw a card and it kind of feels like you earned 3 CP by doing that so uh, Echo is very very powerful. Since I'm playing the FFCC bundle I'm playing two copies of Illyria because again once you've got this many EX bursts you kind of want to keep adding more but I don't think that uh, adding Chilinkas and Yuris to hand is ever really a bad thing and it lets you be a little bit more liberal with how you use them. Since I'm playing Yuri, I'm playing two copies of Merylwib, and as weird as this may sound, if I was playing Veritas, I probably wouldn't play Merylwib, because I think that Veritas is a lot easier to just chuck down in the really early stage of the game, whereas Yuri I don't like playing unless he can do something, probably the turn he comes into the field, and certainly is likely to stick to the board. Uh, and uh, in those circumstances, I don't want to play a Yuri unless I'm going to get some value out of it, so occasionally Merrill Whip is more important for digging you a couple of cards deeper to something good, while getting rid of a sp spare Yuri that was just going to be a vanilla 8k in your hand. So yeah, I, I think that Merrill Whip is good in builds with Veritas, but becomes more important in lists with Yuri, and occasionally it's important to have two water backups and a few more wind, although that does go both ways. If your only water backup turns out to be Yuna, it's not going to hold you back all that much. Last two backups I'm playing are two copies of Mayuni. I have a really love and hate relationship with this card, much like I have a love and hate relationship with this deck. Uh, I top eighted the Summer Cup in London with YRP being one of my two decks, and I didn't actually play Mayuni at all in that list. I thought that it was good, but it was only really good while you were ahead. I think times have changed, and Mayuni is very good in a couple of unusual ways. Any opening hand that contains Mayuni and Shinra really contains four backups because Shinra can search out this pain. You play the pain and search one of your. Uh, YRP backups and then Mayuni can bounce this pain to guarantee you the other backup if you have a really bad hand and I think that that has gotten more powerful in the face of certain kinds of disruption that's more popular now and also pain since pain is literally free to play and just gives you the advantage of digging deeper into your deck Mayuni I kind of view Mayuni as almost a free backup as well she can either be played as a 2CB backup, or you can optionally, bear in mind it is optional, return a character you control to your hand in order to draw a card. If you rephrase that, you know, if you translate drawing a card to being about 2CP worth of value, you could imagine Mayuni saying Mayuni costs zero if you return a character you control to hand. And in the case of Pain, returning a character to hand is almost nothing but upside. So uh, Pain being able to play her twice in a turn and uh, and generate a ton of extra CP and, and that much extra filtration, drawing a card off Mayuni, drawing a card off Pain, drawing a second card off Pain, it, it can uh, really sculpt your hand quite a bit closer towards finding Veil for Unfina. So that's powerful. And also playing Zidane, Mayuni Zidane, in a turn is a lot like playing a Legend Sephiroth out of Ice, but you get to choose the two cards that go. And that's really powerful and uh, can throw a lot of setup decks off of their setup. But I don't think Mayuni is absolutely mandatory even yet. If you would rather play something more consistent, you could play Brother in there. If you want more disruption, you could play Archer. A couple of techie cards that I also haven't included in this list, just because I, I, I kind of wanted to uh, to spread out a little bit, and I was conscious that I needed enough water to get Yuna reliably into play. I think you could totally play Halicarnassus for blanking Ustolas and Aerith in this list, and I also think you could quite easily play Magisesters if you're really scared of Fanfruit spam. There was one other thing that came to mind. Uh, it's gone now, but if I think of it, I'll put it in the description. Uh, the, the perils of doing these things live. So that is my take on YRP for this opus. I would love to hear your success stories of using it, and uh, yeah, um, it helps to be a little bit more informed on this deck because it's definitely not going anywhere post-ban. Uh, taking away that Riku does not change the reason that this deck is good. The reason the deck is good is in this Holy Trinity right here, with Yuna as kind of the, the centerpiece of the Deathly Hallows. So watch out for it. Pack your archers, pack as much negation and clever discard as you can, and hopefully you'll be fine against YRP. If not, you can always just join them and use the list in the description. Thank you very much for watching.